Please note that as a result of the tape recording and copying process, there will be a bit of blank tape at the end of this A-side and an equal amount at the beginning of the B-side. So when the speaking stops on this A-side, stop the tape, turn it over and play it from that point on the B-side. You will have missed only a second or two of what the speaker was saying. This lecture forms part of a series with the overall title Gnosis, The Way Within, held at the headquarters of the Theosophical Society, 50 Gloucester Place, London, W1U8EA, in the autumn of the year 2002. It took place on Sunday the 20th of October, was entitled Astral Projection, Becoming an Invisible Helper, and was given by Yanis Pittis. The programme notes summarise its contents thus. Every student on the spiritual path knows that the most direct route to enlightenment is through service. Those already engaged in service on the physical plane may also during the night continue their work on the astral plane, albeit in an unconscious way. This talk will investigate the qualities and abilities of an an invisible helper on the astral plane and the appropriate and safe techniques for conscious astral projection. Yanis Pittis has led courses in Kabbalah and related spiritual disciplines for more than 20 years. Thank you very much for uh, that welcome and good evening to you all. Can you all hear me at the back? Good. The first thing that we need to know about astral projection is that... Uh, <laughs> that's very, very apt. What I was about to say was that we all have taken thousands of trips during the hours of the night. And indeed we have. And so in this talk we will uh, try and uh, outline a simple method by which uh, those of you that do not remember your astral trips that you take during the night, that can remember them now, and uh, thereafter learn how to use that uh, natural process uh, consciously and effectively so that you can astrally project. And of course, learn also some of the different methods by which you can uh, independently of uh, the hours of the night in any place, any time, take uh, astral projections as well. Now, of course, the necessity of uh, discussing the subject matter calls us to outline the reality of what is the astral plane and what is the astral body. The astral plane is one of the seven planes of manifested existence. Life manifests itself in the multiplicity of itself through the seven planes of manifested uh, material substance, each plane being denser than the one above it and of course finer than the one below it. And so the astral body is actually generated or created by substance that is taken from uh, those subplanes of the astral plane. We said that there are seven main planes of matter or substance in manifestation and each of these planes has also seven subplanes. Therefore, the astral plane has 49 subplanes. 7 7 makes it 49. And these 49 subplanes essentially uh, incorporate what uh, in uh, the various uh, Bibles of the world might be called the heavens and the hells of uh, the after death states. Naturally, human beings during the night travel uh, in their out of body experiences in one or other of these uh, planes. And uh, they gravitate to one or other of them depending on what vibrations they carry within their own astral body. So the astral body is really one of the seven vehicles of the entity that we are. The I am presence, when it begins its involutionary journey, clothes itself in various sheaths or vehicles the finest of them being the volitional vehicle, then uh, what we might call the highest emotional vehicle, then the higher mental vehicle. Below that, we will say it is the lower mental vehicle. Below that, the astral 
or lower passion vehicle, and then we have the etheric and the physical vehicle. So, naturally, the astral vehicle is the one just after your physio-etheric vehicle. Physio-etheric, I mean, I put the etheric double and the physical as one, for essentially they are one vehicle, the etheric being constituted by the higher subplanes of the physical plane and the gross material body being constituted by the lower subplanes of matter of the physical plane. And so the astral plane really is where most of our feelings uh, on everyday existence and lower passions and instinctive passions uh, manifest. And our astral body is created by those feelings and emotions and passions that we actually have. In the very early stages of our evolution, the astral body was but an incohate mass of color surrounding the physioetheric vehicle. But, of course, as we moved on in our journey, we have managed to develop it to a certain degree, and most human beings have a well-defined astral body that essentially takes the shape and the form of the physical, only made up of a more subtle matter. So we might say, oh, are you okay? Did you hit your leg? You're all right. Okay. We might say that um, in the same way that light penetrates the element of air and also the element of water and the element of water penetrates the element of earth and naturally we can see that the density from the earth to the water to the air to light is obviously great of that density of fineness. And so it is with our own actual vehicles. So the higher vehicles interpenetrate the lower and our astral body is interpenetrated by our mental and the astral body interpenetrates the physical. And when uh, we go to the dentist, which I'm sure most of us do not like to go to, but we have to, when they give us this uh, anesthetic, then part of our astral body is pushed out and thereby we are not able to feel or sense the pain uh, in that uh, dental chair. So the function of the astral body is essentially to put the consciousness that we are in touch with the sentient plane of existence, which is the astral plane of existence. Another of its functions is to convert the sensual vibrations through it, the corresponding centers of energy in the astral body into the experience of pleasurable or unpleasurable. And of course, when uh, you wish to repeat a pleasurable experience or avoid an unpleasurable experience, you have that quality that we call desire. And so desire actually brings into the equation an element of the mental or manas or the mental body because the mental body needs to be present to have the memory of the pleasurable experience that you wish to repeat and the memory of the unpleasurable one which you wish to avoid. And so without the memory, you would not really be able to want to repeat a pleasurable experience or avoid an unpleasurable one. So that is also part of the function of the astral body. Throughout our existence, we spend enormous amount of money in making our physical body look pretty and look good by all the various uh, um, makeups that we use or nice clothes that we wear. If we would but spend a fraction of that on cultivating a more beautiful astral vehicle, then of course our evolution will be accelerated by a great deal. So we would also reflect on the means and ways by which we can develop our actual astral vehicle. Of course the subject matter today is astral projection and naturally why do we want to actually astrally project? The appropriate reason to do so is to become an invisible helper. And what does that mean? It means to really be useful and a good servant in the astral plane as one might be also on the physical. But if you are not interested in progress and evolution and 
helping and serving others on the physical plane, why would you want to be on the astral plane? And therefore, if you are here without already having some degree of interest in progress in the spiritual field and in some way serving already on the physical plane, it might be out of curiosity or perhaps of some uh, other selfish reason such as uh, always being able to know whether the bank manager will give you the bank loan that you are seeking <laughs> or uh, um, whether your boss will give you the, the, the raise that you've been waiting for or bypass you again like the last time or perhaps uh, to uh, tickle a little bit the vicar's uh, memory who's been giving all these uh, powerful uh, sermons on being good and so on about his secret habit that you might have picked up and uh, whatever else it might be that it takes your fancy or some of the books that uh, have been written about astral travel suggest that people in the astral plane can actually satisfy their sexual uh, desires which uh, they have been deprived of on the physical plane. Now I tell you, none of all of these are reasons for why to learn the sacred art of astral projection. The only reason to learn that consciously is that you may accelerate your own evolution by realizing and totally dissolving away the delusion of fear and uh, all the associated uh, ills that it brings and helping others to overcome that fear of death and fear of being extinct when you lose your physical body and all other types of fears of that kind. As well as that, of course, its usefulness may be that you may go to such schools of learning, the holes of learning and the holes of wisdom as they are known in the astral in the higher astral planes and in the higher mental planes, respectively. Such a reason will be a very good reason to invest the energy to learn how to astrally project. If you learn how to astrally project, then at the same time, you also learn how to mentally project. And so, can you really make use of such an art? Well, if you can dream, which you do, if you can daydream, which you already do, if you can imagine yourself being in some other place other than right here and now, then of course, if you can do all these things, then you can also astrally project consciously. So we already have said that during the hours of the night when we go to sleep, we actually produce that phenomena of astral projection naturally. And when we are out of our body, actually we give the physical form a greater opportunity to rejuvenate and recharge. Therefore, that is another reason why we might actually wish to choose to bring ourselves out into the astral plane temporarily for five or ten minutes and give a great rejuvenating boost to the physical form. For imagine that you have not slept for a couple of nights because of certain pressures of daily life and you have to perform to give a lecture or to go on the stage if you are an actor or you are a doctor or whatever you might be in whatever field of service you are involved in and you are utterly, utterly exhausted, it will be very, very useful to be able to take 10 minutes and just consciously bring yourself outside of the physical form, give the physical form a quick boost, like a battery charge. You know, when cars are flat, you can have a, a very fast battery charge or a very slow one over a whole 24 hours. Well, this is like being able to have uh, a fast recharge for your physical form. There are, of course, other reasons, and throughout the course of the evening, we might highlight some of them. But essentially, throughout the night when we go to sleep, scientists who have investigated the whole period of sleep time, they have identified three major stages. But of course, the occult scientists know of four major stages. The three stages that uh, the outer or exoteric scientists recognize are the first stage, which is the hypnagogic stage, as they call it, and that means really the beginning of you going to sleep where all the events of the day are just being processed through the mind and through the brain, and you are sort of falling into a semi-sleep state, but also halfway awake. When that stage comes to an end, which is approximately 10 
up to 20 minutes from the moment you hit the deck, so to speak, falling on your bed, then there is a certain phenomena. This phenomena is a kind of a gentle jerk that you may experience. Some of you may already have experienced it. Now, that jerk is actually the signal or the sign that your astral body is beginning to dislodge itself from the physical. And this is the first stage. That jerk is because the astral body dislodges itself and puts itself at an angle from the physical body, and that's when it begins to externalize. So that next stage, after the hypnagogic stage, and after that jerk happens, which might wake you up sometimes, is what is known as the A stage. The A stage of sleep lasts for approximately 90 minutes. During those 90 minutes, you are actually, as an entity, consciously out of your physical form, on the astral plane, using your astral vehicle, experiencing whatever you may experience. After those 90 minutes, approximately, you come back, and that is known as the D stage. And during the D stage, there is what is known as the REM period, the rapid eye movement period, where your eyes are rapidly moving back and forth, up and down. And the difference between the A stage and the D stage is essentially that if you are awakened from the A stage, you will feel rather sleepy, you will feel a little bit disconnected, but very calm and at ease. But if you wo are woken up during the D stage, you will feel rather disturbed and shocked, as if you were just wrenched out of a very involved movie that you were watching. So the D stage is like consciousness watching very actively, very involved emotionally, a certain kind of a movie of events of the day before or the month before or the current information and energy that your astral body has brought home. But the A stage is essentially when you are out of your body and experiencing the out-of-body uh, fields of possibilities and opportunities. Now, this kind of experience that you have on each and every night that you go to sleep, it is possible to actually make confirmed and convince yourself that it happens also by a very simple way. Just when you fall asleep, prepare a simple little test and say to yourself that I wish to be woken up at the time towards the end of the first stage of A period or towards the end of the second stage of A period. There is a certain scientific um, institute in America which has done research over many, many ordinary people who have gone to sleep on, and been watched and observed, and they were awoken in the end of A stage or in the end of D stage to make record of what actually are the phenomena. And naturally, they found that the greatest success of people remembering the full astral trip was actually when they were awakened during the latter part of the second A stage, which is approximately two hours and 15 to three hour and a half after you have fallen asleep. For remember, we said 10 to 20 minutes, the hypnagogic stage, 90 minutes, the first A stage, another 10 to 15 minutes of a D stage, and then another 90 minutes of an A stage. So if you actually put your um, alarm, music alarm clock, and make it a classical one so you don't have a shock when you are actually called from a beautiful astral journey, back to uh, your physical brain, and you time it so that it wakes you up at the time uh, just towards the end of the first A period or the end of the second A period, then in that moment, be quick to make a note or have a little recorder right next to you so that you can actually say quickly what it is that you have brought onto the physical brain. The reason for that is that very often, the very second that we enter the physical brain, we have very good memory of what experience we have had. But just a few seconds after, all that is wiped away because the vibrations of the gross material plane and etheric plane are so much more denser and powerful 
they quickly wipe away the astral memory that you have brought and therefore if it is not imprinted appropriately on the physical brain the memory will, will be wiped away so if for a few days you actually try this little experiment and you wake yourself up towards the end of the first A or the second A period then you will begin to remember and recall your astral trips and that of course will give you the conviction that indeed you are actually traveling in the hours of the night and you are astrally projecting now if you want to really go further and test that then what you can do is give yourself before you go to sleep a certain task as an example you might say if you have a mother or a father that might be sick and it's far away from you say that I want to visit tonight my mother and really see in what condition she is how she's feeling and see some details in her room where things actually are and then when you wake up during uh, the A stage make a note of what you have brought from that astral trip and naturally then you can check that with your mother or you can do it with a friend who lives in another country or far away and really have the conviction that you are definitely able to do that now there have been so many events that I have actually been recorded of a proof that astral projection does actually exist and it is absolutely real there is a documented uh, story such as there were a couple of boys that were exploring some caves under a farm and uh, suddenly started rain and they tried to find their way out of the caves for water started coming into the caves and they were terrified and so in their panic they could not find the way out so one of the boys decided to continue to run whereas the other said I will stay here and wait until somebody actually finds us now the boy that tried to start running uh, hither and thither to find uh, the way out of the caves fell and hit his head on a stone and naturally by accident was actually projected outwardly of him from his physical form so with the freedom of the astral body very quickly he traveled the various caves and found the way out through the light and when he returned back and was awakened to his body although he had a bit of a pain in his head nevertheless he was able to take the hand of the other boy and follow the, what he had seen in his astral projection and save themselves and take themselves out of the caves there is another documented story of this uh, woman that uh, was paralyzed from the waist below and indeed one day she had uh, said to her parents look you have been looking after me for so long uh, why don't you take a holiday and uh, uh, go and, and rest somewhere in another town I will be fine I will have a friend uh, come and visit me and stay with me and all will be well so th they did just that and the friend came and they were spending very good time together until the phone rang and uh, the friend was told that uh, his her sick father that was actually in hospital was uh, ready to die and she must come at once uh, that night a fire broke out uh, next door and the smoke was actually coming into the flat of the half paralyzed girl and she called and shouted but no one would actually hear anything and she actually panicked and she didn't know what to do but then she remembered that she was during the night able to have all these experiences out of her body and so she decided to try and project herself out of her physical form and get some help and so she did and uh, because she could not find anybody else that uh, could be imprinted with her uh, projection and uh, the help that she needed for her physical form she actually gravitated towards where her friend was in the hospital with the sick father who was dying and so managed to imprint the dying father's brain with the thought that to tell her daughter that her friend is in danger to be burned alive and the daughter hearing these words from uh, the dying father's lips immediately rushed to the house and naturally saved that uh, lady's um, uh, life and such stories abound there is even uh, actually documented evidence uh, sometime in the 1870s when uh, an MP um, called A. 
J.T. or T.P. O'Connor was on his way to Ireland, but uh, and other MPs actually saw his double or his astral body in the Houses of Parliament in the normal position which he um, which he held. Another story again of um, uh, two uh, MPs, um, Sir. Um, I think it was Sir McNeil and uh, Sir Hafer, uh, who saw Mr. or Sir Nash, who was actually uh, sick in bed, and yet they saw him in the Houses of Parliament and nodded to him, and one of them asked him a question, but he didn't reply, and then suddenly he vanished before their eyes. And then they realized that perhaps he was actually dying in his uh, deathbed, for he was very sick. But such Documented evidence do exist, and uh, they can be found in the many books on astral projection. And uh, there is one uh, very, very good uh, book uh, that has lots and lots of such evidence by uh, Sylvan and uh, Muldron, and I'm sure the library will have it here if uh, you cannot find it in the books. For you. It's quite an old book, but there is a lot of collected evidence regarding that, uh, this kind of stories. Of course, I have had my own experiences of astral projection, else I will not be sitting here and uh, talking to you about the subject matter if I had never done it myself, because that will be foolish, because it will only be a regurgitation of information that I may have picked up from here and there. And I tell you that is not the case. From the very early age of my life, from a, being a young child, I remember very, very well that I will come out of my body and travel at great speeds in a place uh, in a distant land in a, a special house where some great teacher will give instruction to his students. And I will receive much knowledge at the time and bring it back to my physical brain. And whereas other children had great uh, objections to being put to sleep, I actually rejoiced and looked forward to going to sleep. For I remember that my nightlife was so active and so stimulating and so many wonderful things that I was uh, picking up from them. So naturally, my experience... Uh, was uh, from a very young age in respect of this astral plane. So fearlessness was there as far as uh, this phenomenon of death was concerned, for I realized that there is no such thing as death, but there is only difference of dimensions and states. At another time, I was told that really I snored when I was asleep, and I didn't believe it, of course. Nobody does. Uh, <laughs> until uh, one uh, day... I was in a, a little ho in a little hotel uh, in Oxford, having uh, just come to this country, and uh, we were staying with a friend, and stayed the night there to explore all the wonderful sights of Oxford, and there are many there with all the universities and the beautiful canals and so on. It's a beautiful city for those of you that have not visited it. And uh, that evening, I actually was conscious on the astral plane, seeing my physical form, snoring away <laughs> like a tractor. <laughs> and so I realized that what others were saying was absolutely true. And so from then uh, onwards, I have uh, accepted the reality that I do actually snore. And uh, my wife, who is present here today, will uh, confirm to that reality. <laughs> For I wake her up sometimes. <laughs> so, of course it can be stopped, and uh, certainly with certain kinds of practices it can be stopped if one wants to invest the energy and the necessary investment of time to actually make it happen. There are, of course, some simple devices that you, one can buy from a chemist and put uh, on the nose to, um, to help that process. Anyway, there is many, many evidence and many, many stories. I remember um, one of these uh, teachers that you may have read here, some of the books regarding uh, this teacher known as uh, Daskalos, the Cypriot healer. Uh, the Magus of Strovolos, yes? Now, I spent uh, quite a bit of time with this man, and uh, he would turn up in my house. Uh, he lived in Cyprus, and I lived in uh, London, in Holland Park at the time. Now I live in Sussex, uh, further away. But uh, I remember very clearly at different times of the day or night, he would actually turn up, and naturally materialize his body to a certain degree so that I can actually see it and make a note, and he will convey to me 
something that uh, was important or some aspect of the teaching or whatever was actually necessary. And the beautiful thing was that um, I saw him taking a different form. And that gave me the idea that you are not limited to keeping the actual uh, counterpart of the physical form that your astral body takes. He was able to take the uh, form of a, a, a radiant disk like a sun, which filled the whole ceiling when he actually manifested with a particular color frequency that he was carrying at the time. So if he was trying to convey to me some kind of spiritual teaching, uh, then beautiful radiant violet light will be the whole aura of that radiant disk. If he wanted to convey something much more intellectual, then uh, a very yellow radiant color will be uh, caressing the whole aura of that uh, radiant disk. And if uh, there were uh, uh, other more mundane elements that he wanted to inform me about, then he may have uh, more uh, a red color aura uh, in that radiant disk that uh, meant uh, that he was informing me of some kind of uh, information to do with the administration of matters pertaining on the physical plane to do with the work. So I have had directly the experience from teachers, and when we talk about what it is to be an invisible helper, I will tell you, of course, some additional stories of some of the things that uh, I, as well as other individuals who are members of these bands of invisible helpers, of these groups of invisible helpers in the inner planes, uh, get up to during the night. And indeed, many uh, phenomena that occur on the physical plane where sudden uh, healings apparently occur and sudden uh, individuals who are uh, in a terrible uh, uh, mental state uh, wake up and feel perfectly at ease might be the intervention uh, from some invisible helpers. And so let us take it for granted that indeed we all in the hours of the night, astrally project, and it is a very simple matter to learn how to consciously astrally project. So one of the methods by which we can actually produce that phenomena in actuality is to take advantage of the natural mechanism that occurs just before we go to sleep. And the way to begin to do that is, first of all, to clear all the worries from your mind. Because if you are obviously having a lot of physical worries, then they will interfere and make the hypnagogic state um, last too long, and then you will fall asleep, you will not be able to take advantage of it. So clearing off from your mind all matters that pertain to your worries. Take a piece of paper as an example and write down all the things that you need to do as a personality on the physical plane. And then put them in the fridge and say, I will deal with them when I come back from the astral plane. And so, in having chosen a place that you want to lay your body to astrally project, make sure that it is not next to electrical wiring, for that will interfere heavily. Make sure that your mattress, if you really want to have a good result, does not have powerful springs, metal springs, for that will actually interfere. Any heavy makeup should be taken off. Any heavy jewelry should be taken off. For all of these, uh, carry their own particular vibrations and can actually interfere with the success of your first test run. So the way to really um, bring about this phenomena is, first of all, as we said, to recognize that you do it every night and wake yourself up towards the end of an A period sleep where, and make a note and record and convince yourself that it happens. Then try again in the hours of the night for a week to actually prolong a little bit the hypnagogic state consciously and just when you are upon, about to fall asleep, let your body fall asleep, but you maintain yourself awake and thus you wake yourself up in the dream state. And some of you may have had that phenomena when you are actually awake in the dream state. You are dreaming, apparently, but you are awake in it, and you can actually do things consciously and manipulate certain events. Now, if it is a, a real astral projection, then you cannot manipulate all events. 
if it is a dream state in your head, then when you are awake, you can actually uh, change anything and everything, and nothing can interfere with it. So as an example, if a, a car is coming towards you, the physical counterpart of a car, then it will just pass right through you. And if you are trying to concentrate and make it change course, it will not do so. It will pass right through you. It will not damage your astral body. So be not fearful if you are on the astral plane and suddenly you're walking on the road and a car passes, for it will not damage you because the two dimensions are of different um, matter and thereby the subtle vibrations of the astral body do not get uh, shocked by the physical matter that passes through them. And so the astral body can pass through walls. I see sometimes uh, bodies coming out of their physical forms and opening doors to actually walk out of rooms. It is not necessary. You can just walk right through the door without opening the door, yes? So in their minds, they still feel that they have to open the door. But consciously, if you uh, realize that uh, you are in a different dimension, then you can just pass through the door or through the world without interference. So indeed, you have the capacity to transfer that subtle awakened state by letting your body fall asleep and you carrying that awakened state into the dream world. And if you can do that for a few nights, then you are ready to really take a conscious test of astrally projecting. Then you can choose it at um, a normal uh, a day or uh, evening. And uh, one of the things that you would have realized if you have maintained yourself awake and pass through that slight jerk that occurs just before you're falling asleep, you would have noticed a certain astral signal. This astral signal is very, very important because it will help you to make your conscious astral projection. This astral signal may take the form of either the room suddenly becoming brighter, you notice a brightness in the room, or you might suddenly feel a buzz in your forehead, or a ripple of energy in your chest, or a kind of a breeze of a wind suddenly passing. And so any, there have been a recording of many different phenomena that occur during the moment of the exteriorization of the astral body from the physical. But these are some of the main ones. And so if you have observed yourself as you are coming out during the hours of the night, and you have been able to maintain and wake yourself up in your dream state, you may have noticed what your actual signal is. And if you do notice it, then make a note, because that will be very helpful. So in your test day, when you want to really consciously astrally project, you will focus your attention on that signal and on one other matter. This other matter is the necessity for why you are actually astrally projecting. There are two powerful drives on the astral plane. On the more grosser realm is hunger and sex. But in the higher realm is love and hunger for spiritual knowledge. And so if you make your necessity love, i.e. because you love someone who is in the faraway place and they are sick or they need your assistance and you deeply want to be there with them, but events do not allow you to travel there on the physical plane, then use that as your necessity. So having prepared yourself, maybe have a shower or a bath, and having chosen your safe place, then lie down and focus the attention in your breath. Take a few comfortable deep breaths and allow that regularity of the breath to really relax your body, for all begins with relaxation. And be aware not to fall asleep, maintaining your self-awareness during that relaxing period. So when you feel that you are actually really relaxed, then focus the attention on that signal. And for about five minutes, concentrate on that signal. And then for another five minutes, on the actual necessity of your destination. Then begin to actually build, just above you, a counter image of your physical form. Imagine that like a steam rises out of your physical body and creates this beautiful image of your physical form just above you. And then see it being lifted up 
towards the ceiling, looking down at your physical form. After a few moments, just relax again and you'll find that that image that you have created falls back into your body. The second time that you try and do that, then focus the attention in your destination and at that moment either you will find yourself actualized in the place where you have set your mind to go to or not. If not, then return back and focus your attention again on your astral signal and concentrate again on the destination for you might not have been able to imprint that in the astral counterpart of your consciousness. This is one of the methods to uh, astrally project but there are of course other methods. One of the other methods is to imagine when you are lying on your bed that you are actually at the bottom of a lake and after deeply relaxing your body to feel the same stro strong force that you have when you're trying to rise out of the lake when you're just running out of breath and you really force yourself to rise out of the water to have that feeling, that desire, that power to really rise out of your body with that same sense. But before you actually do that conviction in your mind, focus your attention on the destination that you actually want to go to. That forms the necessity for why you are externalizing yourself out of your physical form. Another very uh, wonderful method, which has been very successful for some of the uh, students that were taught it is to lie down again and use the breath as the vehicle to astrally project. You take 40 breaths, deep breaths, to approximately 12 counts in breath, 6 counts holding the breath, 12 counts the out breath. 12 counts mean 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So to count the 40, you might actually put your hands on your stomach and each time you complete one breath, you tap with one finger. And then the second complete breath, you tap with your second finger. After you have done 40 complete breaths of that, simultaneously focusing your attention on the astral signal if you know it, and if you don't know it, just on your destination that you have set your mind to go to, then knowing behold, because your astral body would have been so highly charged by the 40 breaths, you will find yourself astrally projecting. ...of actually doing it. But all of these include putting your body to sleep, i.e. the body falls asleep, and you are being externalized. There is one other way which has not been publicized anywhere that I know of in any of the books that um, have been written on this subject matter. And this is the most advanced way and it is a way that uh, initiates and great masters employ whenever they need to. And that is that they create what is known as a Mayavanic body. Another actual body by the power of their creativity. They take sometimes 10 days. If you are doing it for the first time, it will take at least 10 days to build and create this um, form of a counterpart of yourself in some special part of your uh, house which you will not be interfered by others. And then you learn to transfer your consciousness into that form that you have built and learn how to employ the four great ethers, which are the kinetic ether, by using your consciousness and the kinetic ether to make that form move its hands, move its legs and walk, by using the sentient ether so that that form can actually sense and pick up information, by using the imprinting ether so that that form, whatever it experiences, has the ability to imprint it upon itself so that when it comes back to you, it can give you the information, and then obviously using the creative ether to create that form with uh, the kind of power and possibility that it can act as your instrument. And thus, those that are able to create such a form and employ these four great ethers are able to be 
in more places than once at the same time. So the physical form can be giving a talk right here and now, while that other form can actually be in some other place helping somebody else. And not only one, you can make several. And so the masters very often can manifest at the same time to many students in different parts of the world. And the students are all amazed that the master is giving them the full attention. <laughs> they feel special and privileged for the master's attention is upon them. Little do they know that the master probably simultaneously is conveying teaching to thousands and maybe millions at the same time. And so, indeed, this is the most advanced way of uh, employing the astral or the mental planes. But, of course, it is a very difficult task to accomplish. And it requires the powers of concentration, the powers of visualization, and the powers of meditation. But the earlier stages that I have highlighted, of course, are much easier for the employee, the facility which already exists in your uh, natural constitution for going out during each and every night. So we said that the purpose for doing this is to really become an invisible helper. And what is an invisible helper and what do they do? Well, the invisible helpers is a kind of a hierarchy that ranges from uh, the ordinary departed uh, souls from the physical plane that are a little bit awake and uh, have the interest to be of value and of service. And so they are given a little task for a period of time to oversee uh, a little granddaughter or a grandson and uh, just uh, project some kind thoughts into their minds and into their hearts to the next stage up of young students on the probationary path who want to be use useful and they are very eager to be of some service during the hours of the night. And so they may gravitate to one of these uh, bands of invisible helpers, which is overseen by uh, an initiate of uh, some degree, to actual full accepted students of the great masters, to initiates, and of course the masters themselves. So this great spiritual hierarchy of uh, the spiritual parents of humanity has always existed upon this planet, will always exist, and is in existence right here and now as we speak. And they oversee the great manifold avenues of evolution of humanity. And the, particularly the seven major avenues of evolution, which are known as the seven great rays, which predominantly individuals gravitate to one or other of these rays, meaning as an example, those who are politicians and leaders of the world, certain times they are faced with very crucial decisions and suddenly in the hours of the night they may become aware of a solution or a way that they can avert a great disaster. And so when they wake up they may bring that information. That information may have been put there in the vicinity where they actually um, live and have their being by one of the great initiates or teachers. I remember in one case where I was traveling out of my body and I saw a very gruesome phenomena. A young lady in Greece, she was somewhere in Larissa, in the, middle, in the Midlands of Greece, uh, had just had a baby and she dumped it in a, a, a rubbish uh, bin and uh, tried to escape. And of course, this baby would have died. And so I saw the phenomena and what was I to do? I, I, I was, my physical body was uh, at least uh, 200 uh, kilometers away from where this event had happened. And so I tried to see if anybody was around that I could actually impress that information on. And no one was able to, to receive the impression because they were all busy walking, thinking about uh, their work and this and that and the other, agitated by, about something or other. And so eventually I actually uh, managed to impress a kind of uh, what you will call a vagabond that uh, sits on uh, the uh, sort of benches uh, in the park. And uh, he happened to be absent-minded for a moment and his brain was imprinted to go and look in the rubbish. And he found the baby and of course he called the alarm, started shouting and people came and the baby was actually saved. And so such a, a, an act uh, can be done by an invisible helper. 
There are many such events documented. You, I recommend that you buy a little booklet here that I'm sure is in the Theosophical uh, Bookshop um, by Leadbitter, uh, Invisible uh, Helpers by Leadbitter. Is that not the title? Yeah, and you will find many stories. One of these stories was uh, a little boy had gone out uh, to play in the fields and uh, he fell into a large big ditch and hit his head and be became unconscious. And for a long time, he never came back, and so the whole family started being agitated. They called uh, the police, the local uh, uh, fire brigade. They were all out looking. They had not found anything. And the little sister that he had was actually praying and saying, please, please, God, bring back my little brother. And uh, Ledbida apparently was passing uh, by, and he perceived this call, this prayer of the little girl, and he responded to it. And he went and looked and found the boy unconscious. And uh, he tried to help it to rise, but uh, he could not do it. And so he tried to impress the father, but the father was too upset with uh, the loss of his uh, son. He was not impressionable. He tried to impress others. He was not succeeding. And eventually he succeeded to impress the dog of the family. <laughs> and so the dog actually went to the father, started tugging the uh, trousers, and eventually, uh, the father took notice of uh, the dog that wanted to go out somewhere, and the dog led the people to where the boy was actually lying, and naturally the boy was actually saved. And so there are many such stories. Um, can we actually travel to the future or to the past? Yes, we can also. But we cannot change anything from the past. Imagine if you could actually change something from the past, yeah? Uh, if you change it, imagine you could actually change um, the situation of your birth. Then you wouldn't be there to be making the change, would you? <laughs> In the first place. So changing the past is an impossibility. But you can actually see certain things into the future and come back and then make changes in your here and now life which will obviously alter your future if you had seen that the way you were acting, behaving, or vibrating might produce some uh, unpleasant or unhelpful phenomena into your future. I tell you of one situation that occurred to me very recently. I was in Greece, and uh, a couple of years ago we bought a large property in which uh, this college, the Philalithia College, is situated in Sussex. And we had a lot of problems with the title. And, um, I understood that everything was in order and the title was fine. And in my actual um, uh, astral projection, I became aware uh, into the future of an event where apparently the solicitors that we were using had gone into administration or they had been intervened by the law society. And I was actually sitting uh, in another lawyer's office waiting to pick up my title papers and so on and so on. And I woke up. And when I came back to England, uh, I remembered obviously very vividly this event, so I called my lawyers and tried to get all my documents in advance before they were intervened. But they refused by all means that they knew how to, to give them because they pretended that all was in order. I had that full conviction, and I should have followed right through and gone there, but I lived in Sussex and they were in Luton. And so I thought the journey was too long, and knowing behold, two weeks later, I get a telephone call from another firm of lawyers saying that, um, sorry, Mr. Pittis, but your lawyers have been intervened and they are no longer in uh, practice and uh, you must come along and uh, uh, pick up your uh, files, etc., etc. Then I had discovered in looking at the files that there was no title and I was told that there was a title. And so the whole problem was obviously revealed. And so I was able to see well in advance the actual events, and then I found myself in that exact office, the exact lawyers that I saw in my out-of-body experience, sitting there waiting for the lawyer to make all his telephone calls and confirm that I was who I was saying I was, and so he can give me the actual documents. There are many such uh, uh, situations. There was another time when uh, I was with uh, my teacher, and um, before, of course, uh, uh, this event uh, had occurred, I met 
a young lady in a park. And uh, one day we had uh, said that we will meet in the park again, and she didn't come. So I inquired what had happened, and apparently her sister had been taken into hospital, and she was in a coma. So I went to see her uh, in the hospital, and I had not seen uh, the sister who was in a coma because they wouldn't let me. Uh, but I saw the other sister, and we talked, and she was very, very sad. And I said, uh, I will see what I can do. But at that time, the particular teacher was actually uh, not in town. And so I thought, I will see how developed this teacher is. I would actually um, meditate on him and see if uh, he will be able to do something uh, about it, even though he was in another place. And during my meditation, I actually came out of my body, and uh, I saw that I and the teacher gravitated into where this lady in coma was in the hospital. And uh, he told me to put my hands on her head, and he put his hands on her heart center, and we both linked with her higher self, and this beautiful, radiant uh, being, which was the higher self, came back and entered the body. I woke up, obviously, in my physical form, and excited, I called the sister to tell her of what I had uh, witnessed, but she wasn't there. So I went to the hospital, and uh, there it was the sister, the parents, and the grandparents, all excited and uh, very happy, because their sister, their sister had come back, and she was in full good health, and in fact, the doctors were saying that uh, she would actually be uh, released. And so when all the nurses and doctors came out of the room, the sister said, come and I will introduce you to my sister. So I walked into the room and she said, it's you. It's you. I had never met this human being and she had never met me in the physical body. And she was so utterly amazed. And so she related then the story to everybody, how these two luminous beings, uh, one lesser than the other, <laughs> <laughs> that was me, <laughs> had, had, had entered uh, the room and um, created this wonderful happening. And she then said, well, I would like to meet uh, the, your teacher and follow the teachings, which, of course, she duly did when she was out of the hospital and so on. So there are many, many such events. I remember another time there was uh, a Greek uh, lady that called me on the phone and said, um, um, my friend has disappeared for several days, and really I have heard from some other friend that uh, you are able to do certain things. Can you please find out, is she dead, is she alive? I need to contact her parents if she's not alive. What has happened to her? So um, I said, I'll see what I can do. I never promise anything because uh, uh, it is totally inappropriate to raise the hopes of people in desperation. So I actually tried to investigate, and what I found was that she had fallen uh, under the spell of a certain cult. She was alive, but she was totally under the influence of this entity known as Hubbard. So if anybody here is a Scientologist, I apologize for offending the movement. But this is a true and real story. And uh, this uh, human being was utterly uh, controlled by this Hubbard's influence. And she was like a, a dull uh, creature in one of these rooms with some machineries which they call uh, the testing of your uh, emotions and all the rest of it. Um, and, and she was sitting there, and I managed to actually impress upon her brain that she was obviously there against her true will. And uh, I expelled, if you like, the influence of this uh, hapered entity from uh, her consciousness. And naturally, I helped her to get her self-confidence and then uh, demand that she was let uh, out and uh, she was allowed to leave and so she wandered back and her friend had found her. And so that is uh, some of the ways by which individuals can actually be of great help in the invisible realms of the astral plane. There are many, many, many different uh, examples that we can actually use. Uh, there is another situation where uh, one of my students had uh, uh, a friend of hers that committed suicide and she was very disturbed and very unhappy and uh, obviously the parents of the Cumin su suicide uh, girl were very, very upset, and they wanted to know what had happened and why and all the rest of it. Was there drugs involved? Was there anything else? So 
I tried to find out, and I saw this human being in a terrible state, surrounded by some very, very heavy, depressive vibrations of dark browns and uh, grays and so on. And indeed, it was very difficult and took several attempts before uh, my thought forms could actually penetrate her mind. And only after a few attempts was I able to actually get her attention to uh, wake up and uh, listen. And so slowly I managed to help her and uh, taking her into special localities uh, in the astral plane where there are other invisible helpers that will actually take care of uh, such individuals and uh, assist them to overcome uh, this uh, particular state. And indeed, uh, those who commit suicide commit a great uh, crime against uh, the law of evolution for they deliberately turn their back against uh, the Holy Spirit which has created this wonderful physical form for them. And they pay a heavy duty uh, karmic price. But at least this human being was helped to uh, gravitate quickly out of that uh, dark realm for which she might have spent what might be called many years in the earthly plane. For I remember another teacher telling me of a story that uh, uh, a man and a woman were arguing, and they were lovers, and they were arguing very heavily. Um, and uh, he overstepped down the stairs, he hit his head, and actually got killed. It was an accident. Um, but he constantly played over the same story of uh, the last words that he had actually said to his girlfriend. You will see. I am going, but you will come and look for me. You will come and seek me out. You will forgive me. I will forgive you, and we will be together again. He kept turning over and over this in his mind. He was not able to move from that state. In his vision, he still had this lady some 50 years later who had already got married and uh, had uh, grandchildren and so on. He still had her as an image of that youthful young lady that he was in love with, keep still repeating the same image. And this particular teacher found this individual and helped him to realize that actually he had passed onto another plane. He did not believe. He was just locked up in this thought form and he was playing out the same thought form over and over in his mind like a tape recording for 50 whole years which constituted on the physical plane 50 whole years. For in the astral plane, time is not quite like that, as it is in the physical plane. Uh, a few minutes there may actually be a much longer period here, or uh, 90 minutes there might be just a few moments here. And so it is very elastic time. So time is pressing on us right now, and so what I would like to say is I have given you enough stories and evidence of being an invisible helper, as well as documented stories and evidence of where astral projection has occurred, and have highlighted some of the simple ways by which you can actually test it for yourself and bring about that uh, evidence and conviction for yourself. Now, if you have any questions regarding what I already have highlighted and outlined, I am, will be happy to answer them. Yes, it can be. In fact, I remember uh, there is a documented story where uh, a Sufi master was somewhere in Egypt and um, a student came to him and asked him about uh, uh, time and the different planes. And so the Sufi teacher got a big bucket of water and uh, he said to the student, dip your head into the water. And he dipped his head into the water and then the teacher pulled his head out. It was just a few seconds, dipping the head into the water and then dip, raising it out again. In those few seconds, the individual had a whole lifetime played out. He dreamed of being uh, on a ship which was wrecked and he was uh, on the banks of Egypt and there he was taken by uh, some uh, travelers and uh, he was given some food and clothing. He eventually met uh, this uh, beautiful uh, lady and got married and got favor with uh, a pharaoh. 
and uh, he became uh, a trusted member of the Pharaoh's family and he was given a title and lived a whole lifetime and then he died a very happy man with uh, having born several children and been in service to the Pharaoh. And all of that whole lifetime was played out in a few seconds of the teacher projecting uh, uh, this uh, into him mind at the time when his head was in the water. So yes, in a few seconds, you might actually feel that a whole lifetime has been played out. Yeah? How did that to mentally project? How, how did you project your mind to mind? <clears throat> the question was, how do you mentally project? Well, there are different uh, levels to this. There is thought transference, which is uh, not mental projection, i.e. Uh, taking your mental body out of your physical and traveling in the mental body. That is a different matter. You can uh, project a thought form by seeing your friend uh, who is actually um, in another town, as an example, and you visualize his image and you want him uh, to do something uh, which is urgent. So you can visualize them um, and concentrate on their minds and concentrate on the image of what you want to convey to them and uh, clothe it with the intelligence of traveling there and staying around their head until such time as in a moment of uh, open-mindedness the human being can absorb it. Because you can project a mental uh, thought form, but if the mind is not open to receive it, it's a bit like uh, a telephone number. When you are dialing, it gives you an engaged tone, yes? So you've got to wait until <laughs> the phone uh, is not engaged so that you can connect. So it is with such a situation. And in actual laboratory conditions, many experiments of this, which is called telepathy or thought transference, have been made and uh, have had tremendous successes. And so you can play this little thing uh, by, f you know, with friends sitting on one uh, uh, room and another uh, sitting in another room, and you hold uh, uh, a red color uh, paper and you project this red color paper, and the other person is uh, endeavoring to be in a receptive state and then uh, receives the colors and you may go through several different geometric shapes and then cross-check with him or her and see how successful you have been. So by the practice of doing that, of course, you succeed in being able to be more effective in thought transfers. But mental projection is actually follows suit the same principle as the astral projection. Uh, when you have raised your uh, astral double out of your physical form and it's either above in the ceiling looking down on the physical form or at the edge of your bed looking at your physical form uh, on, the, uh, on the bed, at that moment you can either concentrate on your destination and see your mental body disengaging from the astral and travel with your mental body or travel with the astral body as well. If you travel with a mental body, it's actually like the speed of lightning, very, even faster than the speed of lightning. I remember at one time I was again in Holland Park and uh, in this occasion uh, I mentally projected suddenly and it was so fast that I came out of the planet completely and I was observing the aura of the whole planet and seeing my body down I got a bit of a shock and I rushed right down and it was so fast that I went right through my body right out the other side of the planet and out again <laughs> <laughs> then I realized that I must control this ability and so I came back a bit slower and settled in my physical form. Of course, uh, uh, during the hours of the night, uh, students are trained uh, how to handle such things. And of course, astral projection can be done for spiritual purposes as well. Um, to go, as an example, to the master's uh, ashram or to his private quarters for some interview or to receive some uh, teaching or to pass certain tests as an example, one of the tests might be to distinguish between uh, an astral form that is insoled or an astral form that is like a shell. And to know the difference between an empty cell, shell, uh, like a dead physical corpse, or an astral body that has a kind of vivification, like a, a life and reacts and responds as if it were alive, but it is not insoled by the entity, to distinguish between the two. Or to be able to uh, see the reactions that you may have when you come in contact with very unpleasant individuals who have done you terrible wrong in the physical plane, so that how you will react, if you will react with aversion or you will react 
with uh, an appropriate inner equilibrium. Or another test about the intensity of light that you can actually handle. You know, when you look at the sun and it's too bright, you cannot actually handle it. In these higher planes, you are also tested to what level of intensity of light you might be able to handle and absorb without uh, causing a disturbance in your own inner equilibrium. Or it might be that the master may wish uh, to convey to you uh, some uh, uh, guidance in respect of some element which uh, you are still holding on to, which is preventing you from a greater platform of service. And so the way to actually beautify your astral body, you know, you have mirrors. And you go in the mirror and look and say, oh, I look a bit old, I look a bit tired, I need to do something with my physical form. But what is a psychic mirror where you can actually go and look? What is your psychic body looking like? Some of you might actually become very highly impressed when you look at your astral bodies because they are so brilliant and light with colors. And obviously, they might give you the sense that astrally you are far more beautiful than you might be in a physical form. Or it might be the other way around, that you look at your astral body and you run away because it looks like a, a beast. You know, the beauty and the beast might have something to do with this where uh, uh, someone may apparently have a physical form that uh, does not look so attractive, but uh, they are such a spiritually selfless and magnificently uh, benevolent human being that in their astral body they have the vibrations that have beautified this form. The incredible thing is that in the astral body you cannot lie. Yes, whatever you're feeling is self-evident in the moment. You cannot prevent others seeing it. And in the astral plane, your hatreds, your jealousies, your joys, your uh, happiness, your benevolent uh, feelings all immediately reveal themselves. And the quality of the emotion determines the actual form that the image takes that is seen in your astral body. So if the quality of the vibration of your emotion is a fine and higher quality, then the form will be wonderful. And so people who are meditating in a very devotional state towards a master or God or a teacher, you might watch them and you will see these beautiful blue-like flowers emanating out of their forehead. And that was the original purpose for bringing flowers to a place of worship to a higher God or to a higher entity. It is not the flowers that we cut from the garden that we take now and the uh, flowers of garlands that we throw in churches and so on. But it was the flowers that we truly generated in our own astral and mental bodies by our devotion. And this indeed is what actually occurs. And when, of course, you are vibrating with a different energy, a different form will uh, be seen in your astral body. So, yes. Yes, it's very important. Thank you very much for the question. And so for the time that we have, I would like to say that uh, protection is very, very important. But the first thing that I like to say is that every time that you go to sleep at night, you are already protected. You don't come back in your physical form and find that somebody else occupies your physical form, do you? <laughs> it's, so somehow this uh, house that you have is very well protected and uh, nobody interferes with it. Indeed, there is what is known the guardian archangel. This guardian archangel, the Greeks have called Sandalphon, which means a co-worker, a co-brother. It is a simultaneously an aspect of your higher self and an independent entity, an agent and a servant of the Holy Spirit or the Brahma aspect if you are a Hindu. Naturally, this entity is the one that utterly protects your physical form when in the hours of the night you are out of body. And sleep period, when you are out of body, is a sacred time respected even by the wildest beasts. It is said that in the jungle, if you are really asleep, wild beasts will not trouble your physical form unless they are utterly, utterly, utterly starving and essentially they, they, their own extinction is in the equation, they may actually interfere with your sleeping state. And so the stage of sleep is respected by all entities. However, just like there are mischievous entities on the physical plane who play a prank uh, or uh, 
who are trying to manipulate you on the physical plane to take your money out of your pocket or whatever else. So there are such entities on the astral plane. And in fact, worse, there are some uh, entities, human entities, ha that have chosen not to follow the path of evolution, but they're still hanging on to the methods and ways of involution, which is the forces of separateness. And such entities may interfere if your vehicle has a kind of status or has the kind of um, power on the physical plane that may serve their vested selfish interest. At that time, certain kind of additional protection, especially when you consciously astrally project from any place at any time. That is when you need additional protection. And the additional protection that I would uh, give uh, is this. Invoke the blessing, if you are a Christian, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you are a Hindu, the Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. If you are a Muslim, Allah, it doesn't matter. If you are an atheist, invoke the um, supreme energy, supreme cohesive principle, supreme energizing principle, and supreme creative principle in the universe. Whatever you are, it matters not. Invoke the absolute energies and imagine that by the power of the absolute flowing through the I am presence within you, you create the symbol of the absolute which is a circle of light around your physical form horizontally this way around your physical form. Then create another circle vertically up and down under your physical form and then another circle in front up and below under your physical form again. Thus, in that way, you have created what is known as the divine encircled cross. So you have a cross in front of you, a cross above you, a cross to the left, a cross below you, a cross to the right, and a cross behind you. For the three encircled circles that you have created form this, um, in the sixth direction, these crosses. A cross is a symbol, the equilibrium and balance, and all forces and energies must become equilibrized, i.e. balanced, before they enter. Thus, thus you declare this place in space to be a sanctuary of protection only for your physical form and that no spirits incarnate or discarnate of any order with malicious uh, intentions can enter this divine sacred space that you have created. So if you actually follow that uh, will be very very powerful. Various books on astral projections suggest that you take copper and create a circle with copper and take salt and uh, sprinkle water with the salt and uh, uh, do all these sort of mantrams. There is a lot of paraphernalia to fill up the book pages, okay? <laughs> which is of no real consequence. But if you really create this divine circle uh, cross that I have uh, highlighted for you, but with a conviction that it is not you, the personality that's creating it, but it is you acting as a vehicle, as an instrument of the I am presence in service to the absolute, infinite, limitless life, then knowing, behold, the highest is the absolute. And all entities, whether negative or positive, must bend their knee or yield to the absolute. And therefore, that circle will not be penetrated by any malicious entity. For I tell you something. On the physical plane, the astral body can pass through the walls. On the astral plane, an astral thought form that you have created with that kind of highest power will be like a brick wall to an astral entity that is trying to enter it with a malicious intent. And that's, that is your shield and your protection. Of course, if you are going to do some special service in the hells of uh, the astral plane, as we are told in the Holy Bible that the Lord Christ entered like the Prince of Peace, the hells, and uh, helped and liberated many souls. Then there are some other more powerful uh, protections, but it will not be wise to outline them here and now. Uh, however, let us learn, first of all, how to walk before we rush into the hells of the astral plane to be brave and heroes and save every soul that is caught up in there, yes? Let us help our neighbor who might need a bit of help because he's very depressed to begin with, with a little bit of a positive thought form, yes, that we impart to his mind. Yes, one circle this way, one circle that way, 
under, and one circle this way and over. Yes? So when they meet at the different points in front of you, to the right, three circles. Three circles. Yes. But with the conviction that you are invoking the absolute, infinite, limitless aspects of life, your I am presence, i.e. your divine self, and the vehicle that is doing the divine in circle cross is just an instrument, yeah? not by the power of the personality. Okay. Well, if you do that, which I have just said, then of course uh, that is a very good protection. But one other simple protection is to be vibrating in your mind. That is why the Hindus have a certain mantra that is actually uh, vibrating beneath the uh, the level of the mental awareness while they are busy doing their everyday things so that continuously they generate a vibration of the highest order. They might be using the mantra Om Mani Padma Ham or they might be using another mantra that they, the Gayatri or whatever else, uh, which generates these high vibrations and that maintains their focus on the inner link. Yes? Yes, Kiriya Laysan. Kirelason, 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 Kirelason means, Lord, have mercy upon me. Okay? Kirelason. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, my dear. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, depends what they are. We must not uh, do away with the prudence of the current uh, consciousness that we have on the physical plane. We must not allow us, as you see, astral projection must not become another drug. You know, it mustn't become something that we, instead of going to the movies, we astrally project. It must not be, instead of going to the theater, we astrally project. <laughs> instead of going to a friend's house to have some time uh, with them, we astrally project. No. It must be as a complementary part of our living in the everyday existence, and that the information that we draw from it, we need to evaluate it prudently using the faculties that we have, uh, the reasoning faculty that we have, and endeavor to intuit also the reality that may lie therein. And of course, if you have a query with something, you can double check it. The next night uh, you go to sleep, put as a test, I want to travel to the same place where I saw that and reconfirm this. So if on several occasions you do this, if I had thought of that, I was too busy looking after my ill mother at the time, if I had thought of actually doing this, I didn't pay too much attention, I would have confirmed it several times and then of course I would have actually acted on it more forcefully as you rightly suggested. Another thing that can really confirm that uh, the astral plane uh, uh, does exist and we do astrally travel, some of you may have dreams where you meet individuals that you have never met on your physical plane, but you are very intimate and you know them very, very well. So they are beings that you know on the astral plane. Blind people, yes, know of their dreams and they see very, very well there. I know that because my mother is blind and she tells me in her dreams how she really uh, meets such and such and uh, she sees she wearing different color clothes and this and that and the other. And so wonderful confirmations all around. Go and speak to a blind man. I guarantee you, if he remembers his dream as a blind man, he will not be blind on the astral plane because on the astral plane the impairment of the physical eye does not exist. It is his astral body with the astral senses that is actually picking up the information. Yes? And so on the astral plane is not blind. One more, yes. Uh, if you meet somebody on the astral plane in a dream who has recently died, 
Yes. Well, it, it, it can be a real meeting. Depends, of course, on um, the nature of that um, uh, dream experience and how powerful and how vivid it was and what that uh, uh, so-called uh, departed person uh, conveyed to you. Uh, certainly, it is um, uh, very truthful that uh, it can be a real meeting. My brother died in an accident and... Uh, that uh, night, uh, when I found out that that had actually happened, I went searching for him. And uh, 